morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, in today's webinar, as part of the IEF platform, uh, we are going to take a deep dive into unveiling the happiest places to work, navigating employee involvement and talent acquisition in the AI era. Just to set some context here, in today's rapidly evolving landscape, the quest for organizational success has taken on a new dimension. Work is no longer just a source of livelihood, but a means to add value and create an impact in society as well. For employers, too, it is no longer just about employee engagement, but rather fostering a genuine employee involvement vis-a-vis -vis employee as a stakeholder or employee as an investor, you know, to cultivate a sense of fulfillment and boost productivity thereon. This webinar explores the concept of happy workplaces, shedding light on the transformative power of employee involvement while also navigating the complexities of talent acquisition in the age of generative AI. We'll delve into why engagement strategies are becoming outdated and how involvement is emerging as the cornerstone of organizational culture. Additionally, we'll explore uh, the future of talent acquisition, examining how AI is reshaping recruitment practices, uh, the ethical considerations at play, uh, and the best practices for leveraging AI technologies uh, to build diverse and inclusive teams. So join us for an enlightening discussion on redefining workplace happiness and studying uh, or to stay ahead in the age of uh, uh, AI-driven innovation. Uh, we have three eminent speakers with us today. Uh, I would love for you to introduce yourselves. Mr. Nash, if we can, you, uh, if we can have you go first. Hi. Um, thanks, Bala, uh, for uh, setting up this panel. <clears throat> I am very happy to be with my uh, fellow co-panelists, very accomplished individuals, both Madhura and Parul. Uh, about myself, uh, I'm uh, Nash Narsiman Tupil. I've, be, I've been uh, working for more than three decades in the IT industry. <clears throat> I've been in HP for more than 27 years, uh, been in various parts of the globe in HP. Uh, my, current, my current job is uh, I am the head of services business for Asia Pacific, Japan, and Europe, Middle East, and Africa uh, for the HP store, which is also an e-commerce engine. Um, I've been a sales and marketing professional for almost uh, 25 plus years though I've done uh, a little bit of odd stints in finance and <clears throat> other other areas. Um, that's about me. Um, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Nash. Uh, if we can have you, uh, Ms. Parul, to give an introduction about yourself. Absolutely. Thank you, Bala and my uh, co-panelists. Um, my name is Parul Makkar and I lead the human resources uh, function in a Nonprofit uh, called John Snow India. We are a, a not for profit working as a public health organization, a consultant to the government of India, uh, having our headquarters in the US and our presence across the globe. I have been working in the human resource domain for the past two decades. I am a double MBA in human resource and finance with a certification in human resource talent management from XLRI and a psychometric uh, profiling certification of 16 PF. I am currently leading the entire HR domain with LND, compensation and benchmark recruitments and talent management to name a few. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Barun. Uh, Ms. Madhura, if we can have your introduction as well, please. Thank you so much, Bala, and good morning to Nash and Parul. I'm an NLP practitioner and a learning and development specialist. I have close to two decades of experience in various, uh, you know, organizations in across the globe. Um, I'm currently a principal consultant with Great Manager Institute, which is a sister concern of Great Place to Work. I have domain expertise on program management, capability building, knowledge management, and change management. I too have had uh, you know, stints in various kinds of roles. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of my experience and looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for joining us. So let's kick start by the first question here, which is apropos the, uh, the context that I had set a few minutes back as well. So how do you really differentiate between employee engagement and involvement? And why is it crucial to make this distinction for organizations? And how uh, exactly uh, is this transition even made possible? So we'll start off with uh, Mr. Nash, your thoughts on this. A good question. And um, that is the difference between engagement and involvement. <clears throat> engagement is a feeling. If I can put it very simply, engagement is a feeling. Involvement is action. One is thought. One is feeling. The other is action. I mean, uh, the best example I would give is uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Okay. 
um, he is not a great orator. If you have seen Mahatma Gandhi, he is not a great orator. But he does certain things which people see, which inspires people, like the Dandi March. He just walked 200 plus kilometers to take a salt in his hand, his involvement. Or giving up his uh, barrister suit uh, after being educated in England and wearing the loincloth. You know, it's a very, very powerful uh, way to show he's very involved in the freedom struggle. It's an example of involvement. So if you see, if you see, an engaged employee need not be an involved employee, but an involved employee is definitely an engaged employee. Okay, so so examples of um, involvement is when when your employee puts up their hand to do volunteering, or extra work, or being part of uh, panels, or being part of um, you know tiger teams, or anything which which actually requires to roll up their sleeves and work. Okay, that is an example of involvement. An involved employee is the highest tribute uh, a company can get in terms of from a for a HR executive. Okay, if a, if any of your things mean something to the employee, only then if they if they mean only they will actually do it. Okay, uh, so any of these things are only vision statements unless they get involved and do it. So involvement is that that is the big difference about that. That's my view. That's fantastic. Uh, that was crystal clear and it's easy for us to take away from this as well, right? Thought versus deed, right? That's the difference between engagement and involvement. So thanks for clarifying that, Mr. Nash. Ms. Parul, what do you think about this? How do we, I mean, why is it important to transition from engagement to involvement? Absolutely, Bala. So as rightly put uh, by my uh, co-panelist, uh, Nash, uh, I would take you back to the MBA books that we studied uh, during our uh, studies, a gentleman called Frederick Herzberg mentioned and gave a two-factor theory where he beautifully explained the idea of motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic. So extrinsic factors probably are money revolving around the motivational factors that why you're working, why you're coming for work every day. However, there are intrinsic factors which motivates us from within ourselves, like the purpose of us coming to the work every day. So when I work with my teams, I see a lot of uh, emotional commitment as uh, rightly put by Nash. The enthusiasm of employees that they possess towards their work and the organization. So such kind of factors uh, put together uh, contribute as employee engagement. If they agree with my policy, if they are committed to following them, they are dedicated. Uh, they are loyal, but they may not be involved in the process of building the organization culture. So interestingly, employee engagement for sure is the first step towards employee involvement. I call employee engaged, employees who are engaged as passive contributors. They are contributors, but they are contributing passively. Whereas involvement is a degree to which the organization is allowing the direct participation of the workers in planning and continuous improvement. Uh, by providing them a platform to contribute their own ideas and expertise and take active participation. So I'll give you an example. Uh, and these people I call active contributors. So for example, from smaller steps like naming your, uh, you know, naming your employees club or a cafeteria or deciding your own pay or benefits matrix to broader and larger steps like contributing and impacting value proposition in designing a customer centric or a customized solution to meet the needs of the niche customer. So I would say involvement is an active contribution and engagement is a positive, uh, is a passive contribution. Yeah, great. So passive versus active, you're saying, and, and people who are absorbing what's being thrown at them. And, and on the other hand, you have uh, involved people who are actively adding value to and contributing to the organization's culture, right? They are uh, organization builders. Great. Uh, fantastic thought. Ms. Madhura, uh, what is your thought on this? as to why is it important for organizations to transition from uh, engaged employees to involved employees? So I'm not getting into the uh, into the definition anymore because I think that's pretty uh, established that, you know, uh, when you're only engaged, you're a passive observer. So I'm not getting there. I want to bring in another perspective. So there's a generational difference also. So, you know, till a while back, our generations were, I think, mostly motivated by money among many things but today's generation that is generation z who are you know more and more coming into the workforce they are not at all motivated with money simply because they are coming in from very established backgrounds 
right? So most of them are people who are coming from economically stable families, etc. So for them, it's the purpose which matters. So Generation Z is looking at things in a very different way. So they are a more aware generation. So they want to have a purpose. They want to ensure that they're feeling that they're, they're a partner to the company. Hence, involvement is becoming a key. So engagement, which was only limited to HR, you know, arranging for some things and, you know, you are just participating in some company related activities kept us happy, but that's not what cuts the eyes for this new generation. So I think it's the generational difference, which is making involvement more a key rather than engagement. So if I were to say it in one line, engagement gets you in the game, involvement gets you to the top of your game. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks so much for that thought, uh, Madhura. It makes a lot of sense as well with Gen Z. It's important for us to give them some purpose uh, so that they are involved and more productive as well. Otherwise, it will just be run-of-the-mill sort of work which may not really get us anywhere or definitely not get us to the top of the game. Great. Uh, continuing in the same vein, we'll just take it a step further. So, uh, I think the why part is very clear as to why this shift of uh, organizations from engaged employees to involved employees should take place. Is there any examples in your illustrious career that you have seen of this being successfully implemented? Uh, and along with the case study, if you could also share some learnings and takeaways that you had with that experience of this transition. Again, Mr. Nash, would like to start with you. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, uh, there are many companies which do this very well. Um, I mean, I would just uh, point to two companies. One is the Tata Group. Uh, I mean, they really say it that uh, profit is not the only, we also make steel. You remember that ad, they say we also make steel. So obviously they are doing many things which is beyond. They created the city of Jamshedpur uh, out of uh, nowhere, you know, just because around the steel plant, they started building schools, hospitals, you know, temples, um, churches, masjids and everything. Why they should do, you know, it's an example of involvement and who did it? It's actually their own employees. Okay, they didn't go and get some other people to do it. They saw a purpose which is bigger than just building a steel plant. An example, I'm just giving it. It's a perfect example of, <clears throat> you know, uh, I mean, this is many, many years back. It's like 50, 60 years back they did it. So this is an example of uh, a good example. I will also give my uh, company's example, HP. Uh, HP is a very old company, as you know, in the IT industry. Uh, there are only two companies which have more than 75 years of uh, um, experience, IBM and HP. And I, HP has been there for more than 80 years. And uh, we are still a very old-fashioned, old world valued company in many things, in many of these, uh, similar to the Tata Group, I would say, in many ways. Um, see, we have a policy in which uh, it's almost mandated an employee has to give 40 hours of volunteering work in a day, uh, in, a, in a year. So what is 40 hours? Eight hours for five days, which is a working week out of 52 weeks. So one week out of 52 weeks. Imagine if uh, 70,000 employees across the globe just give one week of their 52 weeks. So they mandate it and uh, I do it and many of my colleagues do it. For example, I teach um, an MBA program, a complete uh, university credit course for e-commerce. I spend more than 50, 60 hours um, taking two weeks off and HP has allowed me to go and teach um, you know, in a university. So that's an example of me giving, but I know many of my colleagues, for example, who do who are a traffic cop in a weekend, okay, uh, helping, uh, you know, if you see some Koromangla or Indranagar traffic cops, some of them might be HP employees wearing a traffic cop uniform on that day and doing that work. Uh, lake regeneration, once again, in Bangalore or um, planting uh, seeds in this Miyawaki forest. And there are many things which we do very quietly uh, in HP. But uh, examples of involvement, why would anybody take a beautiful weekend and rather than sitting at home and watching a movie in Netflix, why should they go and spend four hours uh, in, in the horrible traffic of uh, Bangalore? Because they feel that by being for four hours, you're helping, you're a part of the solution and you're not complaining anymore, right? About bad traffic. You are doing something for it, right? That's an example of uh, involvement. Oh, fantastic. Great to hear that. So it's important for us to instill that sense of purpose in employees so that they take up these activities and feel that they are a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem, right? So I think a great thought. Ms. Parul, uh, how would you like to illustrate a case uh, where you have successfully made or seen a transition of employees from being just engaged to actually being involved? And what are your takeaways from the same? Absolutely. Thank you, Bala. So I have two examples to quote. 
One uh, from my previous organization, ITC Hotels, where I worked for about three to four years and I was led, uh, leading their HR function. So they have a very beautiful, um, you know, architect wherein they um, call all their employees from various hierarchies. So they pick up their, uh, you know, bunch of employees as samples to test a particular uh, new service that they're launching. So before they launch any new hotel or a restaurant, they ensure that there is a pre-joining team who sits and has uh, the breakfast and the lunch as uh, their most esteemed guests would have. And then there are observers, there are note takers, the LND person is standing over there and everybody is taking notes that from which minute to which minute the order was given, uh, how long did it take for the uh, kitchen person to prepare that order and how long uh, and how beautifully that order was served to the table? Was it hot? What was the temperature? How was the uh, server behaving with the staff, etc.? So the, the people who are made to sit are from the human resource, from the sales, from the marketing, from within their employee customer bench. So they obtain their first-hand feedback and a, a special emphasis is given to localization. So if they are opening up a new hotel or a restaurant in Kolkata, they will ensure that they have some Bengalis or some, some uh, you know, flavor of the local uh, people over there so that they also are able to understand the local cultures. So this is how they're involving each bit uh, of their employee throughout the hierarchy, throughout the salary grade bands, ranges etc and also giving special emphasis to the local people over there so this is the first example where they feel everybody empowered and involved uh, when a new uh, you know hotel comes up the second example from my current organization so which is john snow india we work very closely with the government of india and we are a bunch of doctors and medical practitioners and researchers now all of most of these people are uh, very highly qualified uh, think tanks and some of them are even the uh, you know the conversation starters in uh, very large boardrooms where the tech, you know where the uh, information is being uh, released or where a new concept is being uh, given birth so, for example, the NEP policy 2020, when it was prepared, uh, you know, in the sectors of the government, there were a lot of other think tanks like uh, nonprofits who were working in the education sector who had contributed very positively so that the NEP policy could, you know, be formed. So this is the government way of involving all the nonprofits like us. We also take part very actively in the Ministry of Health and Family Wear, Welfare at the national and the state level, uh, wherein we... Uh, contribute towards preparing the policies from various, giving various, you know, uh, different opinions and aspects of creating a policy, which is a whole, you know, whole, uh, the policy comes as a whole to you, you know, to the, uh, to the uh, country. So this is our bit that we are doing as a part of uh, involvement um, by giving and empowering our employees, giving them the platform to go and join hands at a scale, at a level where your contribution actually matters. And it is uh, compounded to the effect that it is reached to the larger masses of the country for the many, many years to come. Fantastic. I think from your two examples, my two takeaway, takeaways are, from the first example at least, it seemed like having empathy seems to be the foundation to be involved so that you actually understand uh, things from everyone's different points of view. And from the second example, it seems to be that inclusivity is also extremely important because you can't just, for something like uh, uh, NEP, you can't just take uh, the point of view of just educators. You should also probably look at not-for-profit organizations and multiple other stakeholders in the mix so that you have a well-rounded, comprehensive view of things. So I think that's that's great. Thank you so much for sharing this, Ms. Parul. So, Ms. Madhura, uh, what do you have to say about maybe some uh, examples or cases that you have personally seen or maybe uh, implemented it yourself wherein uh, the transition has been made successfully from engagement to involvement and what are your takeaways from that? So, uh, I have been uh, with Genpact uh, for six years, uh, right before this stint with uh, GMI. And uh, in Genpact, we practice some beautiful, uh, you know, initiatives which actually involve everyone. I would like to talk about one which is called Hackathon. It's an annual idea generating in uh, you know incident that involves every employee from top to bottom right it's a series of process improvement ideas that you're encouraged to share 
I've seen the kind of a frenzy that people get into, you know, to share their ideas and, you know, uh, the whole FaceTime that is, uh, you know, designed along with it. So it's the branding of it, right? So I'm sharing ideas. How am I, uh, you know, being acknowledged for it? And the impact would be uh, that, you know, because of the FaceTime that people would be promised, right? They would be doing anything to come up with the best of ideas. And that in turn would actually help the company, company because the business would have so many new ideas that they end up, you know, implementing. And at the same time, it helped create a culture of appreciation and recognition, which in turn boosted employee morale and productivity. So I think it's a very simple way to involve people, ensure there's no you know, barrier in terms of your levels or anything. You may be an entry level executive, but you've got an idea which is so brilliant that you get to sit with Tiger Tiagras in our ex CEO and kind of, you know, have a boardroom conversation. And I think that itself, you know, makes everybody feel amazing. So, yeah, I mean, I, though I've left Genpact already, but I really live for all the kind of, um, you know, ideas that they come up with and the way they keep people going. And it, I've seen it impact retention as well. Retention numbers really start dropping the moment people feel that acknowledged and, you know, that uh, empowered. So, yeah, that's a simple example from my life. Great. Uh, I'm able to actually relate this point to the previous point that you made as well. With respect to Gen Z, it's important that uh, structures are not seen as shackles by Gen Z. You're able to cut the ice by having events like this where there is no Absolutely. apparent hierarchy. Because in events Absolutely. like this, like a hackathon... Anybody can actually rise to the top and uh, be not really restricted based on what your role or designation is, etc. Uh, that probably gives a sense of, again, being included uh, yeah. and being, uh, you know, involved for Gen Z people as well. Also, for me, I think it's very important as an l &D person, uh, you know, it has been very important for me to observe, become very conscious of the fact that there's no, uh, you know, same way you can deal with everybody. And I think that's one of the traps that we get stuck into like the same thing will not work for everyone yeah, with this yeah. generation with this kind of workforce you have to have a change of perspective yeah, so yeah. yeah no absolutely all right so moving on uh we cannot really have a webinar without talking about the big bad or it could be the big good <laughs> as well of our times which is uh ai slash ml so wanted to pick your brains on uh, now that AI is continuing to reshape the talent acquisition landscape, what are some of the key opportunities and challenges that organizations you believe are facing in leveraging AI-driven recruitment strategies? So is it really going to be a boon or a bane? Uh, if either, then how? Uh, I mean, AI is a tool, okay? And, uh, um, and I'm from the technology industry and I can speak a lot on AI. Uh, in fact, we have just launched uh, our new series of PCs and printers, which is completely using AI and all that. Uh, I, I see AI like a sharp knife, okay? Um, so in the hands of a surgeon, a very skillful surgeon, you know, uh, you're going to save a patient's life by doing the surgery. Um, in the hands of a terrorist, uh, you know, it's a bad thing. You know, you're going to kill somebody with it. So it's just a tool. It's like a knife, you know? The other thing I learned, you know, um, in another webinar like this, uh, uh, one person asked this question, a very rhetorical question. Uh, Google knows all the answers, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's a fact, right? And, and AI, and when Google is powered by AI or if you're using ChatGPT or uh, any of these DAL A4 or any of this, you know, you, you, you even get more answers, okay? So what is the premium when, when knowledge is literally in, in, in a young age, you know, all of us used to know the capitals of the world, world countries, you know, we, we used to mug up many things and know, and that was a sign of success. Now, now that is not a sign of success, right? Because that Google can give you, right? And, and many of these things, right? So what is the premium? You know, they asked in that, in that webinar, what is the premium? They said the premium is not knowing all the answers. The premium is in asking the right questions. Okay, the premium, the premium in an AI world is asking the right questions because AI knows all the answers. So in hiring, now come to hiring, you know. So the first question is, um, who sets the agenda? The three questions you need to answer if you're doing hiring using AI, okay? Who sets the agenda? What is the agenda and how agenda is implemented? Who, what, and how is very important in AI, okay? So, for example, in talent acquisition, I am I, I see AI definitely going to help in uh, in the entry level tasks. 
Okay, uh, just imagine a company like a TCS or Infosys, I'm just giving an example, they hire in thousands. So if they are going to hire, let's assume 30,000 people, they're going to see 300,000 resumes, assuming one is to 10 selection, 300,000 resumes. Just imagine if you're in a talent acquisition of, uh, of these companies, you need AI. You know, you need to shortlist, you need to screen, you need to remove, you need to just remove the monotony of the screening process using AI. Okay, definitely keyword search can be used. Um, you know, the right matching will do. I think I think you'll do. But I'd be very cautious to recruit somebody uh, without a human interview. You have to do a human interview. Okay, because AI scores, while it scores brilliantly on things like accuracy or uh, doing repetitive tasks without drop in quality and things like that, it scores very poorly in four areas where human beings outshine the AI, okay? One is empathy, okay? Second is judgment, okay? Third is common sense. You know, AIs don't have common sense if you think of it, you know? And fourth is sarcasm, you know, humor. A cannot handle humor. A cannot handle uh, sarcasm, you know? you They can't understand the tone with which, uh, uh, suppose you had a very boring meeting and if you crack a joke and said, hi, isn't that a great meeting? The AI will literally think it is a great meeting, right? But you are actually meaning it in a tone which is like horrible meeting, but you're calling it uh, great, right? So uh, there will be scope, you know, I think for using HR, talent acquisition can use AI only in the entry level process. But I think when it comes to final interviews, when it comes to really making an offer, we have to, there is no way, you know, you can do it without, at least in the foreseeable future, you know, uh, you can do uh, without a human intervention, okay? However flawed the humans can be, these are some areas where we are brilliant, okay? So, so uh, if I were to just uh, uh, summarize what you said, um, Sir Nash, is it like this, that AI can be an effective eliminator, filtering of resumes, etc., but then it cannot really be a great selector. Good, good way to put it. Yeah. Good, good, very good way to put it. Great. I, I, I think IPL has left a lot of influence on you. You're <laughs> using word like eliminator, selector. Huh? <laughs> I yeah, think it's I'm, big, the I'm, I'm so a much. big RCB fan, yeah, and uh, you know I'm born in Chennai, and my RCB team beat my home team Chennai, you know, and that was one of the best matches, yeah. Uh, but but KKR won. Uh, amazing work by Kolkata Knight Riders. Great work. Yeah, yeah. Totally deserved to win. I'm a huge RCB fan too, like you. Uh, sad to see them lose out once again, 18 years. We'll wait another year. <laughs> yeah. I'm jumping with joy here because I'm a Bengali and I'm a KKR fan. Yeah, I can see the... I'm it's really happy. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just wanted to interject because I know that the uh, conversation will lead to another aspect. I really agreed with what Nash said about having the tool and, you know, how Google has all the answers, but can we find the right answers? We can't. So, you know, in my way of looking at it, it's the better the question, the better your answer, right? So it, today's age is all about research. It's not about knowing the answer, but knowing how to research. So prompt engineering is the key. So if you don't know how to do prompt engineering, then you don't, AI will fail you. So whether it's recruitment or not, prompt engineering is something that we need to think about. And that's not something that we are talking about a lot. So just thought I'll just add to what Nash said, because I think it's a very important aspect. Thank you. Perfect. No, uh, Ms. Madhura, is there anything further that you want to add to this question? I mean, we can then go to Ms. Parul since you were talking already. You want to continue in this vein? Is there any further thoughts you want to add with respect to sure. how AI can impact recruitment strategies? See, uh, Nash covered all the positive parts. So I'll talk about the challenge, right? True that, you know, the, the analytics part of it. And I agree with him that human touch has to be there. So the blending of it is what we are still working, working towards, right? Because we're still kind of like trying to understand how to integrate to get the best possible outcome. Companies are trying and playing around with gamification and all, uh, stuff. But I feel one area that we are not again becoming conscious about is data security. So if you look at it, a lot of jobs are using AI, you know, for screening, etc. But they're not revealing how are they, what are they doing about data security. And that's something I think we are still immature about as a as a population who are dealing with AI for the first time. So data is the large, uh, biggest currency right now. So now when I am applying for a job and I don't know what they're going to do about it, once I don't get the job, how are they going to use my data? Are they destroying it? What are they doing? 
unless you are uh, you know the more aware people will become people will start taking a call about that too do i want to apply in this company without knowing their data security policy so along along with how am i using ai to enable my uh, recruitment i think it's very important also to become very conscious about what am i doing about my data security and whether am i being able to voice it more transparently to the audience that i'm catering to and i think these are some things that again we need to very consciously think about because very few companies are doing it right now so for me it's this challenge that actually keeps me uh, you know thinking constantly that this is going to be the next big impact and we are not really talking about it how are we going to mitigate that so that's yeah. really my thought because uh, nash has really covered everything so i wouldn't want to uh, yeah no absolutely i think uh, we'll move on to that in the next question as well i wanted to pick your brains on ethical considerations which is to do with uh, one aspect that you picked out ms bakshi which is uh, security the other aspect which is bias we'll come to that but before that i also wanted to pick uh, ms parul's brains on how you think ms parul that ai can shape recruitment strategies in the future absolutely so bala i would take the opportunity to pick where uh, madhura and nash had left this conversation very beautifully put by both of them uh, i would like to quote an example uh, when i was introduced to ai a uh, few months ago uh, and i was introduced by a, my 14 year old daughter i was also asking the same question nash that uh, you you know even google has the same answers why to you know put myself into another hassle of downloading another software and then put my brains towards it to learn and then unlearn and a lot of you know effort will go so she said mom how long would you uh, you know how much time would you uh, invest in researching for a particular topic then eliminating your searches then picking out the right keywords and then expanding on the correct um, you know context that you probably are looking at the ai or these chatbots can do that for you in seconds so data redundancy and the speed with which these softwares can come up with uh, ready made solutions and even customized solutions uh, would be very very beneficial for the ages to come uh, where the volume of work is higher as rightly put by nash and uh, also giving its due credit where data security and you know uh, all of that also comes into place because in 2023 there is a dp dpr act which has come into picture and uh, you know where uh, the personal information that is uh, being fed into these AI ais while doing the talent acquisition that has also to be given proper due diligence um also another challenge that i would like to pose is uh, all these algorithms of ai are trained by on a certain data set now that data set has to be chosen very very um you know carefully because even that data set could have a bias because ultimately it is being fed by human uh, humans only like us so if i have a bias in a certain data or i pick up a biased data the algorithm is going to produce results accordingly the second challenge that i face is black box black box algorithms where you do not know as a candidate or you do not know as a hr uh, decision maker that how the ai algorithm is either eliminating certain uh, candidates or selecting and proposing certain candidates for you so you always have a degree of uh, you know a doubt whether uh, the right kind of algorithm has picked up the right kind of candidates also or not so these are some of the challenges that i could see in addition to that very important for some organization cost of implementing ai is still a very very important factor and uh, integration of these ais into your current structures whether so for example i if i may have a current structure of uh, say hrms or any other or or i advertise in a certain website you know ex which is externally linked whether i can have my ai algorithm integrate with that system is also another challenge that i have to answer the opportunities on the other hand as we discussed speed and efficiency in high volume uh, business then the enhanced candidate experience candidate is also feeling very motivated and 
you know, because they also have the access to the chatbots 24 by 7. They can ask their queries. They can get their resolutions at their time. So they are traveling, you know, back and they want to just check for a quick questions and they don't want to probably call the recruiter or get into the hassle of disturbing anybody at, the, you know, beyond the office hours, etc. So the chatbots could function uh, during that time. So this is one opportunity area which is highly impressive. And then data-driven decision-making is also very important where, you know, we are in the age of AI where predictive analysis is happening a lot. We are uh, basing our judgments uh, of uh, recruitments in the years to come or in the weeks to come on the, on the predictive analysis basis on the recruitments done in the past, the kind of quality and the volume of um, you know, candidates picked up. They, the, the, the AI is also suggesting various sources of, uh, uh, you know, the channels of picking up these uh, talent acquisition pools, you know. So we could either uh, go for a, you know, a campus placement or advertise in a certain website, or there are any other, you know, a lot of other uh, sources we can where we can pick up these talent pools. So AI is even helping there. And very interesting is, diversity and inclusion, which can be both an opportunity as a and as a challenge, the bias reduction of uh, objective evaluation and scalability, where handling high volumes of data points effectively. So we can have inclusion in terms of, uh, you know, while doing the, uh, you know, course correction and uh, training the uh, you know, these AI algorithms using certain data sets, we can use various sites of types of data sets to have an inclusive uh, algorithm set for the AI. So we can beautifully make use of the uh, AI, provided that, you know, we pay, we, we pay proper uh, attention towards data security and training the AI, avoiding black box algorithms and a lot of other uh, ongoing challenges. Yeah, no, perfect. Uh, like you said, while there could be a lot of benefits such as uh, predictive uh, analysis, etc., you also flagged off certain concerns, right? Which is exactly where I want to take the cue for the next question. So, Mr. Nash would like to start off with you again. So, what kind of red flags or ethical considerations maybe should organizations keep in mind while implementing AI technologies, especially in talent acquisition? And how can they ensure fairness and transparency throughout the hiring process? Because one of the key concerns that has been coming up ever since the advent of AI is that while you know gpt stands for generative pre-trained transformer how exactly is the training being done and how can you really completely eliminate the innate biases that there could be in the training process itself so what are your thoughts on that let's see i think uh, parul covered some very very important points on this question also uh, on uh, transparency data security i think there are three areas we must be very conscious about when using ai okay one is bias Second is data security and third is transparency. I think uh, I'll start from the last transparency. I think Parul said that black box. If you don't know how your algorithms work and if you can't explain how your algorithms work, that is a problem, okay? Um, like in justice, they say, you no, know, justice should not only be served, it should seem to be served, okay? So the same applies in AI also, transparency. You should be able to explain the logic, you know, if something goes wrong, this is how it works. So I think transparency part is very, very critical. The second one, before I go to bias, I'll talk about data security, okay? What is the training data set? If you're going to give the training data set, uh, first of all, uh, you know, you had massive outages of data breaches, you know, a company as big as Meta, uh, Facebook, which has all the greatest computer scientists working for them, you know, they had 500 million records uh, breached um, in 2021, 2022. Um, you know, where usernames and passwords and everything was public in the public domain. They actually sent it as a text file, you know, which could, without encryption, you know. An example, I'm just saying, nothing wrong against Meta, but the point is, even in any of these big fang companies of Facebook, Amazon, Google, Apple, it can happen, you know. With all the best of engineers, with all the best of money they have, it can happen. So, just imagine if you're a smaller company and you're doing AI for recruiting, uh, it can go seriously wrong if the training data set is exposed or, uh, you know, your PII, you know, personally identifiable data is exposed. I think that's a, that's a huge risk. So just to be, as I said, it's like a knife, you know, you have to use it very carefully, right? So for what it is used. The last part is bias. Um, you know, there was this uh, uh, joke 
not joke, but actually it turned out Sundar Pichai apologized finally. Uh, somebody Googled, uh, show me the founding fathers of uh, US. Um, you know, all the founding fathers of US are white men, okay? So it showed uh, four founding fathers, including one black, uh, one uh, Hispanic, one Indian uh, race, and you know, which is not accurate, okay? The sad part is uh, many people think Google and AI provides all the right answers. They provide the answers, not the right answers, okay? They provide the answers, but not the right answers. This is where common sense and other things of human beings really help. You know, somebody saw that and said, hey, founding fathers were never Asians and Hispanics and all these people there. Something is wrong. This chatbot is... So Sundar Pichai himself came and said, there is a bias in my software. I'm pulling it down. Uh, that Gemini, whatever that brand, Bard, you know, or Gemini, I'm pulling it down because uh, there is a bias in, in the training data set what we gave because they only fed all the training data sets which are very diverse, okay? So imagine, once again, I'm saying <laughs> nothing against Google or Meta or any of these companies, but if it can happen at such big companies, the tools are yet to achieve the level of sophistication which we can use uh, for our daily uh, work in a lot of companies. You know, it can do small work, no doubt. Uh, many things which the co-pilot of Microsoft gives in Microsoft Windows, you can do many things. It can be automated, but but you want to do it for uh, hiring. You know, there are so many ethical considerations you have to take care of, uh, especially bias, uh, you know, stereotyping, bias, and many of these things. Because um, as somebody said it, I think Parul said it, 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 it picks up data from the past. Okay, and if the, if your past is flawed, if your past is not what you want to be in the future, it will only reflect that. Uh, uh, jokingly, in the earlier computer days, we used to use this term called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. So in AI also the same thing comes, right? If you put garbage in, the what comes out is also garbage. So so this is a even in pre-trained models, you know, we have to be a bit careful. The, the data sets should be wide very unbiased and very representative of the world and uh, so we have to take care of that. No, absolutely. I think they took their uh, notion of inclusivity a bit, a bit far with <laughs> that question on founding fathers of the US, right? So, as you said, it, it may be uh, politically right, but it is not right. Yeah. So, I completely get your point on that and, and if, if it could happen for such a generic question, it could definitely happen for very specific use cases that we have with respect to hiring, etc. And as you said, if it's not transparent, then it compounds the problem further exponentially. So those challenges do remain. Um, uh, so this panel, I think, of course, you did cover uh, many of the red flags that you see that could creep into the recruitment process while using AI. Is there any, any further points you want to add to that? Uh, Bala, I have already raised the red flags, but I have not told you how to uh, you know, go still go about it and steer your way through. Uh, so if you allow me, I can talk a bit about uh, how to, you know, still make a way through these biases. Of course, by all means, please go ahead. Yeah. All right. So while we understand, you know, this uh, bias uh, in the data sets is a, it could be a problem. So how to probably have a periodic system or regular audit of these AIs to detect and correct the biases. If we if we have an identified system by an identified set of people who are sitting and only fetching biases from the data sets and uh, uh, you know the AI algorithms, that can probably be uh, taken care of. As far as the transparency is concerned, one can clearly communicate. So you know sometimes the candidate also feel that I'm talking to a computer or I'm talking to a system which probably does not hear my emotions. So when an HR lead speaks to you, I speak with my full em empathy, whether a, whether or not a candidate is selected for a job. I would only say there are no bad candidates. Only, it is only the matter of opportunity and the current context that the candidate is not able to fulfill. Otherwise, he could be a very good bet for another role that you might have a few weeks later, or probably another project of yours which is running parallelly. It happens with me multiple number of times. So I cannot just say that, you know, this candidate does not fit the bill and he's rejected. So I cannot put everybody in the same uh, blanket and give a same blanket solution. And a, so I have to very, you know, even, even today in these days, I do not send any reject or sorry emails to my candidates because all of them are 
who have qualified till the level of personal interviews are good enough and relevant enough, if not for the same vacancy. In that con context and duration, probably sometime later. So the algorithms need to probably have, you know, they require more training towards uh, this aspect. Then um, I would like to also uh, mention very important aspect is of accountability framework. The organization needs to draw the line where the decision making will happen, whether the computer or the algorithmic AI will make the decisions on our behalf, or whether a bunch of humans uh, who form the part of the management or any functional group are going to take the decision. So where does the work of AI finish and where does the work of human begin? Or is it correlated or is it parallel? All these kinds of lines have to be drawn and SOPs have to be written very, very efficiently, looking at these biases and the challenges of data privacy and security that AI holds. With this, I hold my answer. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, what I'm really concerned about is how do we really go about actually implementing these things? You know, because it's going to be a very tall order. The accountability framework that you said, uh, timely, regular audits, uh, which should be comprehensive. Yeah, I don't think uh, uh, enough time has passed or enough uh, knowledge transfer has happened for us to be in a position where we could implement all of these things with confidence, right? Uh, Ms. Madhura, what are your thoughts on what are the red flags and how do we go about effectively managing them? So, um, good thing about being last, uh, you know, in, in the line of speakers is all the points are covered. So, I can now <laughs> just about summarize. So, yeah, we all agree that human discretion is of utmost importance. Because no matter what, like Parul said, Nash agreed that, you know, it's about how you train AI, right? So one uh, one of the important things as we keep progressing, keep, you know, working in this thing, it would be to parallelly educate our HR teams on ethical AI and use AI use and interpretation. So that's something we'll have to consistently do so that HR is also on top of the game so that, you know, they can ensure that this balance of you know human discretion is always intact and how do we maintain that ethical framework regular audits as uh, parul said absolutely to check for biases and ensure compliance with ethical standards are maintained and over and above the red flag that i spoke about much earlier clear communication to candidates about the use of AI in the recruitment process is also something that we have to all start working towards. And I'm sure like, you know, the way the market is progressing, we are all going to be, uh, you know, coming up with some more solid answers to all these as we progress. So that would be all for me. Yeah, no, perfect. Of course, uh, it's a work in progress, but of course, a lot of attention and rightly so is being directed in this way as well. So last but not the least, wanted to uh, pick your brains on, uh, on this question, which is, Fine, we've spoken about how can AI be used in recruitment, what are the red flags and how do we solve for them. But last but not the least, how can it really be used to enhance candidate experience and to promote diversity and inclusion in the recruitment process? And what are some of the best practices that organizations are have already incorporated or are looking to incorporate, you know, while incorporating AI technologies in their talent acquisition strategy? Again, Mr. Nash, I'd like to start with you on this. I think uh, AI and its tools can be used in five areas where I think, I mean, by, by the way, I, I mean, it looks like I've been very negative about AI and with all these jokes, uh, I've been cracking about Google and Meta and all these things. I'm not, okay? I'm very pro AI. It's just that I'm saying, um, be a bit cautious when you use it, right? So so let, let me tell in five areas where I think uh, AI and the tools can be used uh, very well. I think to enhance, uh, I think both employee and also employer experience. I think automation of administrative tasks, okay? Uh, because uh, any major company, a big company will have a lot of resumes to work with, okay? So any amount of automation is, is going to be great um, in screening or any, any one of this. The second area I would say is uh, using generative AI to write better job descriptions, okay? And, uh, um, you know, collecting, job relevant information and writing a better job description, which is understood. Uh, and with all its multilingual capabilities in certain jobs, especially in retail, it's very local, okay? You need to hire people in Bengal, Bengalis in Bengal, Tamilians in Tamil Nadu. 
you have to do that you can't do uh, in a retail shop you know you can't get uh, international talent you know you can't get a somebody to come and do it so a is going to help a lot in vernacular a is going to help a lot in doing the right job descriptions and other things which which i think it can be used second area the third area is um analyze the freelancer skills see this is a very difficult one because see many of us have been used to working in a company for a long time i am a good example or at least many years and we gain our um reputation or stature by the company uh, in which what we are doing you know but but increasingly in the future it's going to be a gig economy where you are not going to be known by the company you work for or what you are doing in that company but what are your skills and what you can bring to the table that's a very very difficult art to analyze okay imagine suppose you are you you put your resume in the market where you're saying i'm not working in any company but i'm this is the skill i have and this is what i can bring you have to check whether it's true correct so imagine the power of using ai for it you literally can scan ai can scan every website everything every paper that person has produced every um, you know work that guy has produced which is increasingly more public you can actually get it in a gig economy you can actually analyze the freelancer skills with ai very well the fourth area is creating diverse talent pipelines and reducing unconscious bias it's just the opposite of the fear which we said which is the bias imagine uh, on the other hand you tend to pick up only one type of uh, racial or geographical or one type of recruitment a can actually help you diversify you use it to um, do the other way you know remo removing unconscious bias you know a can be used for that also the last area is um open positions can be filled uh, there are a lot of online databases you know with a lot of intermediaries a lot of uh, digital tools are there in the market but uh, but they don't talk to each other if you see okay there are sites like uh, nokri.com for example i'm saying or the equivalent of it um, you know which produce where, where candidates are putting a lot of stuff and there are companies that are hiring but they don't necessarily talk to each other and there is a huge gap in the middle especially of aligning on what the company wants to what the candidates can give and the candidates are also very poor in expressing what is the real skill they need you know what, what is the real skill they have rather than a textbook skill you know which they, so i think ai can play a very important role in bridging that gap between uh, recruiters and the people who are looking for jobs so i think if you think very patiently strategically Uh, you know you can use ai to if you just imagine like a pyramid and the top most part of the pyramid is where the human interaction um, like my fellow co panelist said you have to do human interaction you have to do human hiring you know because you can't judge things like empathy or uh, other things you know judgment or common sense with ai you know sarcasm or many other things which cannot be detected by so there at the top of the pyramid will always be a human being in recruitment but i would say definitely entry level and to some level of mid level work which is needed in talent sourcing can be we can use ai effectively for that's my view on it fantastic thank you mr nash uh, ms parul what are your thoughts on uh, where do you think uh, you know uh, ai can actually find its use or its uh, application in enhancing employee experience, experience improving the diversity of candidates and inclusivity sure bala i would give you three specific examples um where ai can really really make a difference uh, in the talent acquisition journey of a candidate and also for the hr person uh, i'll take an example of very commonly used practice in all my hr teams wherever i have worked uh, whenever a new employee has to join uh, say for example from monday uh, fridays at latest by 3 or 4 pm we make sure to give him a personalized call we call it a welcome call wherein we remind him uh, about the certain you know 
do's and don'ts. We also take his uh, requirements in terms of his parking space, whether he would like to have lunch with us, whether he would like to have some breakfast with us. And also, uh, if he's using some medicines, can we arrange for that for day one for him? You know, things like that. Or probably he would like to bring his uh, spouse along or probably his child along. Can we make some arrangements for the person who is uh, accompanying that new joinee? So this gives a very personalized experience to any new person who's joining. And over a period, you know, when we conduct our analysis of 30, 60, 90 days analysis of a new recruit's journey, we found out that, they, that these employees have themselves come up and told us that the welcome call that you gave us was the excellent start to my journey. Journey, And I got the idea that I have made the right decision, whether or not I'm going to perform or going to stay for a long time in this organization. But the policies and practices with which this organization uh, is working is excellent way for me to begin my career. With this, I will take this example of AI where the chatbots, if at all the company is using, uh, and the messaging that these chatbots is, is giving, instead of uh, only giving the standard answers to certain uh, common FAQs, we can train the AI to give um, tailored messaging to these uh, people by at least using their names and surnames, or probably uh, you know, altering your message to the cultural specifications or at least the geographical location of the person where this person is going to be finally located. So personalized communication is one. Second is interactive assessments. So AI-driven assessment can help us, help the HR team really in eliminating the subjective rounds or sometimes even the personality tests. So, um, during the initial elimination round, we do probably send a lot of subjective questions to uh, a lot of medical graduates here. After they qualify for that subjective round, is we consider the next, you know, qualify them for the next round. So at least that subjective rounds could be eliminated. The personality tests could be, you know, uh, seeped in into the AI system so that the interactive assessment can happen. They can talk to a bot, but they're actually being, uh, you know, judged on a certain uh, skill set and a criteria, which my co-panelist also mentioned, and uh, an interactive assessment can happen. And third example is virtual interviewing. Now, a lot of organizations uh, like Hilton, like, um, you know, a lot of other um, uh, um, new organizations who are coming up, like, you know, some people have even personalized their, uh, you know, interviews, uh, virtual interviews. And like, you know, this uh, uh, iPhone used a system called Siri that uh, uh, in the same uh, example, this uh, Vodafone is using AI chatbot for candidate engagement. Uh, Hilton is using AI powered virtual recruitment assistant, and they have named uh, this personal uh, assistant or recruitment assistant as Connie. You know, so a lot of uh, like-minded organizations have already started doing the virtual uh, interviews. This saves time in the initial level of uh, recruitments and uh, also is a great starter for uh, developing, uh, you know, uh, well-rounded, you know, recruitment system with the candidate as well as the HR. Great. Perfect. I mean, it's great to see that a lot of companies have already started adopting them, not just thinking about them. They've actually gone past that. So with further refinement, I think, this will become part of mainstream. That's what I'm able to hear from all of you guys that uh, the day is not very far off and this is going to be mainstream rather than just a nice to have thing. Right? So Ms. Madhura, uh, what is it that you want to add to this with respect to employee enhancement uh, in terms of their employee experience itself during the recruitment process and also uh, to be able to enhance the diversity, of, uh, diversity and inclusivity uh, in the process as well? So I'll start the answer from the last question. So. Genpact already has started doing this, I think some one and a half years back that, you know, they're using, so they're very high on diversity and inclusion. So they have been using AI to optimize the job ads uh, by uh, ensuring that no exclusionary language is being used. So now, you know, inclusive language is a very big thing, right? So how do you uh, coin your job ads in a way that appeal to the people without making anybody feel marginalized, right? So that's something Genpact is already doing. And I think that's something which is going to be happening at every uh, company. Definitely, uh, you know, there's a, a certain amount of unbiased 
uh, I mean, rather it addresses unconscious bias when it comes to screening, because it definitely, AI definitely focuses on skills and capabilities rather than personal demographics. And the biggest thing I think where AI is still being worked upon is gamification at every touch point. I think one big uh, problem that people face, I would I would be the devil's advocate here. So I, as a, when I look for a job, I think one of the biggest complaints I have with HR is they don't have a proper turnaround time to get in touch with people. You apply for a job, you get one mail and then there's silence and you don't know what to do about it. And that is the biggest angst people have when looking for jobs. And so that's where AI comes into the picture. So, you know, gamification at every touch point so that people don't feel, you know, they're being, uh, you know, left at a lurch. You feel engaged all the time. So these are the kind of candidate experiences that companies will be able to leverage. And I think AI will make a big difference in making people feel welcome even before they've stepped in to the actual realm of interviews and being selected, etc. So that would be my view, really. Fantastic. Great. So that brings us to the uh, close of this session. Maybe if there is a one-liner that each of you wants to share, uh, you know, as your conclusion, conclusion note, then that would be great. So, Mr. Nash, is there any one-liner you want to share with us? You know, it's uh, once again, I have to tell a joke, you know. Uh, uh, AI can, uh, artificial intelligence can never beat natural stupidity. <laughs> Thanks for giving us amazing quotable quotes like this. <laughs> yes, great. No, no, I, I completely hear where you're coming from and uh, I'm with you on this too. Yes. Uh, Ms. Parul, is there anything that you want to share with us? Uh, I would say that uh, AI is a great enabler, but uh, with empathy and the right amount of human experience, uh, we still have a precedence over AI, <laughs> at least for the time being. Of course. Yeah, at least for the time being. Well said. Yes. Ms. Madhura, anything you want to share as a conclusion note? AI is still maturing. So we have to accept that we are teenagers right now. And we have to ensure that, you know, we are looking up to AI right now and, you know, partnering with it to ensure that we are getting the best of it. So the moment we accept that, I think we'll be able to make use of AI better. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the exciting times that AI will mature and make this world into a better place. I'm very excited about it.